the Human Resources Committee meeting of the Brunswick Glen County Joint Water Sewer Commission. Uh, Human Resources Committee will uh, commence for Wednesday, November 13th, 2019. Uh, present are myself, the chairman, Don Elliott, Commissioner Cornell Harvey, Commissioner Wayne Neal, and Executive Director Andrew Burroughs. I normally don't have the invocation or pledge since this is just a committee meeting. So with that, uh, there's no one that signed in for public comment. And we'll move to the first approval item, which is the minutes from the August 21st, 2019 Human Resources Committee. Do I have a motion to accept those or comment on the minutes? Motion to accept, sir. Second. Okay, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. The minutes are approved. Also, um, you have in your packet the executive minutes, which, because uh, we went into executive session, and if I can have a motion for those. Motion to approve the minutes of the executive session, last minute. Second. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Thank you. And with that, <clears throat> We'll start with the discussion on uh, staff recommended changes to the health care plan. Uh, yes, sir. Mr. Burroughs. Uh, we've got Ms. Katina Tindall with First Coast Benefits here to discuss, help lead this conversation for us. Ms. Tindall, uh, it, for those of you that have been on the board for a while, are, is here each uh, early spring discussing our medical renewals. And she's going to talk us through the process we have and for any questions that y'all have for her related to how you want this process to go come January when we get kicked off. Good morning. So this is really a preliminary meeting to the March 1st renewal. We don't have anything to show you, but we did talk about in that ad hoc committee from last year that reviewed all of the insurance that they would like to have a meeting prior to maybe in the late fall to just discuss anything on how the plan's going are there any issues things to consider for renewal time we will receive the renewal January 1st for the March 1st renewal date and we will have everything ready for the RFP at that time um, what we'd like to do today is just see if there are any big ticket items that need to be discussed and if not permission to have a meeting with that ad hoc committee to go over the follow-up of our meeting last year so i think we're, we're looking to maybe build that ad hoc committee back up and have those discussions to see how everything we chose last year has been going because we did make some major changes last year okay um for the other commissioners would you please go over the uh, current plan that our people have and how many people are uh, in each okay. of the selected areas. So currently you all offer three separate health plans and I'll let Daphne pull up the numbers on how many. Uh, you offer three different health plans and the employees can choose from those health plans. We offer a plan that has co-pays on two of the plans and then we also added a health savings account HSA plan last year which was something the Commission has talked about for several years um, we went up in out-of-pocket and we did go up also in deductibles so we modified the cost to go down in the overall contribution from the Commission and we changed the rates to be a little higher deductible and out-of-pocket to bring the rates down overall. Daphne, how many are in each of the plans? Don't think we had that many people take the health savings account. I think when you have worked for a company that traditionally offers co-pays and you see that everything goes towards the deductible but wellness, that people shy away from that initially. It's more of a, as we talked about in the, in the um, ad hoc committee meeting, it's a long game of people being more comfortable with what an HSA means because an HSA basically means you're going to pay everything until the deductible is met. Once the deductible's met, then insurance pays. But people who use insurance quite often, that, that's a little tough. Do you have those numbers? We have, we have 124 total employees that are enrolled. We have seven that are actually in the HSA plan, 101 that are in the middle plan, um, which is the $1,500 deductible plan, and then we have 16 total that are in the $500 deductible plan. 
500 or no, 1500 the 15 people in the $500 mm, no. those, I mean, we don't have this. I'm sorry. It was a $1,500 and $3,500. 15, 16 people in the $1,500 deductible plan and 101 in the $3,500. And then seven in the now, I, I don't want to speak for all the staff members, but there were quite a few changes to the insurance plans last year, um, and so there was a little bit of a shock to the system, and the health savings account would have been even a bigger shift for a lot of people. And to be honest, I don't know that many of our employees understood what the health savings account was, so we probably need to get some information to them about that a little earlier. Um, they were used to having, uh, as Daphne said earlier, a 500 dollar deductible and a fifteen hundred dollar deductible plan and then we came in with a fifteen hundred and a thirty five hundred dollar deductible they were reeling from that and then we threw this health savings account at them and they had they just didn't want to know anything about it because they were trying to figure out why we was being changed already have there been any questions about that i mean has there been any uh complaints uh uh, you know there what? were some complaints. I think Daphne probably got more of them than I did last year during the actual meetings that we had. Ever since then, I have not personally heard a lot of complaints. Once the initial enrollment, whenever they got the, the sticker shock of, of the plans changing and deductible, um, we haven't really heard anything since then. There was quite a bit of chatter during the meetings, though. So, when otherwise, everyone is kind of uh, acquiesced to, to the plan and, and it's going fine. So far, yes, sir. And I, w I would suspect, like I said, with the, the health savings account, we may have a few more employees that want to go that route this year if we can provide them a little better information about what's going on with that account, especially some of our um, younger employees that don't ever go to the doctor anywhere. They can get that money taken out pre-tax and it actually can convert to retirement funds down the road. So it's an attractive plan if you don't go to the doctor very much. You know, one of the one of the there's always that confusion. I have an HSA plan myself, and I, so I'm, I'm always happy to explain it to people, but you have to have enough money to pay the premiums and take your extra money out of your pocket and open up a health savings account. And so sometimes employees will use it as the lowest cost plan and never open up an account because they really don't have those additional funds to put in. If I never ever go to the doctor, then that HSA plan that I choose, I'm just paying less for my insurance. So sometimes they don't take advantage of that tax shelter account because with an HSA plan, I wish they'd name it anything but an HSA plan. It makes you think you have to open one. But the IRS says if you buy this type of plan, an HSA plan, you can open up an HSA account at a bank. By doing so, you can put X number of dollars per year into that, take that form that shows how much you put in to your accountant, and it will come off of your gross income. Sure. Well, if I'm a W-2 employee that doesn't pay a lot of taxes anyway, Don't it's matter. probably not attractive to me. Exactly. So, and there's also, and you all remember because you've encountered it over your careers, the use it or lose it FSAs. And I think sometimes people confuse the HSAs with the lose it or, use it or lose it FSAs. And so sometimes that scares them. So I know Daphne and all of the meetings and, and I attended those meetings last year, tried to go over that, but most of all, she was sort of having fruit, paper plates thrown at her just because there was a plan sure. that, that seemed so slim um, but the rate was slim as well so we're, we're just trying to move that mark with the employees that's why we went away from those richer $500 deductible plans to show if you go from a 500 to a 15 you save a thousand dollars and so that was the idea of doing that that's a thousand a month or a thousand a year a, a year mm -hmm. so Really all we need today is just permission to get that ad hoc committee back together to talk about anything they would like to discuss, see how things have gone. We have had some claims issues with United Healthcare. We have been able to work through all of them. Um, and fortunately, the Southeast Georgia Health System uh, management has been wonderful about working with us. So we haven't had anything that's been an issue that hasn't been resolved that we're aware of. Okay. now. Then the, the claims history is 18 months, correct? Claims history is not available on this because the group is so small and it's fully funded. So we will not get any claims history. Claims history is only for groups that have self-funded plans or level-funded plans 
all they will give us is the claims versus paid. So they'll give us how much they paid out in claims plus any ongoing claims that they see, and they might give us a couple of diagnoses. So will they, they may, will they break down the medical categories of the claims? They may say that it is a heart condition or a cancer. Uh, but they wouldn't go any further than that. They wouldn't say who or even specifically what kind. Mm -hmm. But they'll break it down as to medical, mental, uh, counseling, and drugs, right? No, sir. Mm -mm. And why wouldn't they break it down? Because legally they don't have to, and they just don't. The, the insurance companies want to give us only what they legally have to give us, so we can't use that information to shop and move it somewhere else, even though we do. We still use as much information as we get. Well, but, it really makes it hard for us to make a decision without that. Well, it may, and with the county and the city, because they have more employees and the types of plans they have that are self-funded, that data is available. But unfortunately, we went with the lower bid, which happens to be a fully funded plan, and that's a limitation that that plan has. So what we do is help you make the decision based on what the benefits are and what the cost is. And as far as the medical conditions, that only plays into what the other quotes look like. Now, if I remember last year's correctly, we were having uh, what was considered a high claims year. Yes. And that because of that, we did not have many people that wanted to do business with us at that time. We did have some limitations do there, we, yes. Uh, do we have any preliminary indications if that's going to be the same way this year? or? We do not. It's Right now, you have to think, like you were just saying, 18 months. So we started March 1st. Let's just say I went to the doctor today the insurance company may not get that claim until mid-January for me. So when we're looking at just a few months forward, we really have to cut off back to, say, August. So we have March, March, April, May, June, July, August. We only have about five or six months of claims that they look at. So we try to look at the claims information in January so we get as close as we can to what's going on. So we Well, why can't you send them a letter now and have them reject it? I want, I want you to go ahead and to ask do. for the claims history for us, and I want it broken down as far as they can do it, and I want to see a letter from them saying, we ain't giving you this. Okay. All righty. Uh, this, this process that I see that we're going to go through is going to take about 60 days until January. A little bit less now but I want to really look at it and I have some other questions <clears throat> on the co-pays mm -hmm. okay do the drug purchases count as co-pays what do you mean by drug purchases I mean if I go out and have to purchase uh, maintenance drugs does that count as part of my copay under the plan or is it just doctor visits and hospital stays no, you have copays on the drugs. It's different than the visit copay, but there is okay. a copay on the drugs. There's, yes, a, there's copay a copay on the, on the drugs, on the drugs okay. except for the do, HSA plan. Do, do we do? Does the plan offer a mail order? Yes. Okay. Do our people take the mail order? I don't. We have And I'll tell you why, Commissioner, because they don't, the insurance companies don't save them enough money to do that in some cases. In some cases, it's only a half a copay to set to do mail order. In the mail order process, you have to get your prescription from the doctor, fill out the paperwork, send it into the mail order company, check with the mail order company to make sure they got it, make sure they're going to send it on time. It didn't come on time. You call them back and make sure, where's it at? What's going on? Oh, my credit card was rejected. Well, nobody called me. Let me give you my credit card again. And finally, they get their medication. It's annoying. When we have, well, and that's generally, one of the that we talk generally about a maintenance it. drug, once you're on it, you don't have the, any of those problems. And in, in, in my case, my primary care f physician fills out all the paperwork and sends it forward. And if I have a problem, I call the, the primary care physician, and they straighten it out with, with the drug provider, which is Express Scripts for me. Uh-huh. So well, you... Well, 
Well, I, I would like some way such to reduce the cost that we, for maintenance drugs, you know, the initial prescription should be maybe get it from from pharmacy, but it's a lot less expensive. So what, what we try to do in the meetings is to show them how some of the local pharmacies have medication programs that are actually lower than even the mail order. So we give that information out standardly to all of the employees and point out that they okay, might be can, a, can you uh, provide to the commission uh, uh, pharmacies that are cheaper? Because I'd like to check into them. <laughs> Okay, those are not really maintenance drugs. Those are more antibiotics, and I understand yeah, that. Just don't, don't, don't. And all that I'm talking about, don't we have a lot of people that um, either have diabetes problems or high blood pressure problems? Yeah. And I want to see what the drug comparison is. That's I mean, wrong. in my case, it's free, but. <laughs> so... I completely understand what you're saying. You're saying if the maintenance medications were less expensive, then maybe they would be, the claims well, would I, be I better. I want to know where our, where our dollars are going. I mean, we're, we're paying money to these companies, and I want to know what is the breakout of where our dollars are being spent. I mean, I understand the overall concept of an insurance, but I want to know where the money is being spent. Okay. Okay. Do you want a separate meeting that we just meet we'll with you We'll have another meeting over? in December. Or, okay. So do you want us to come back to this meeting, the HR committee, or do we want to have this Go to conversation the HR, ad hoc? That's what I'm in charge of. Okay. You did bring up um, last year that we didn't have a lot of people that wanted to quote us just because of our issues. We still, still, still do have some of those going on. We do have one of our bigger ones that was on the one that was costing us probably the most that is no longer going to affect our renewal. All right, any other questions? No, oh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, the information will be valuable yeah, that's others? provided. Do you have a date for that meeting for December? Not yet, but we will shortly. Okay. I'll All get right. it to you as soon as it's scheduled. Okay, good. All right, It'll great. be probably the first week. Oh, okay, good. And we'll go back and see what information we can get. I don't want to tell you how limited I think the information is. I'll just wait and see what we can get. Um, so you're wanting to know just claims versus paid where we are right now. Well, and I want to see much what, the, what our information plan options are. You know, we ought to ask them now what the plan options are and what they're looking at. We will I mean, not. They're going to project that stuff. They are not going to give us any of that information. We are. We I would like a letter from them telling us that they won't. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. All right. that EMB until yeah as far as uh, B on the call sharing until we know what any changes to our insurance may be it's going to be difficult to discuss what percentage of the cost yeah, we the cost sharing right now like tell him what that's right yeah. right now we pay for uh, employees 85% right. and for dependents we pay 75% uh, which was a decrease in the amount we pay for dependents last year so overall everyone's cost went up from an employee perspective our cost as the employer stayed relatively flat so last year we passed on all of the costs to the employees all the cost increases to the That's employees right. which what does the city pay i, I don't know sir I, I i'm sorry i don't have the information I, i'm not part of the plan either so I, I don't know um i know what the city is uh self-insured though so it's a little different from it's a little bit of different yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. yes, Part of our problem is the fact that we're such a small group that right. we need to know where our dollars are being spent. And there may be some ways to um, mitigate. I agree. I agree with you 100%. Uh, how, how we're doing it. Um, one of the things that I want to do this year is encourage employees to establish health savings accounts and that's a tall order yeah i think we explain it correctly yes that they will because that's money that they don't have to spend in the year 
and they can build up over the years um, what's in that account to cover their uh, deductibles that they have to pay every year. Because even if they have, even if they are on the uh, plan that's 3,500 deductible, well, they can establish a health savings account and and start putting money into that, sure. such that that will mitigate sure. what their out of pocket costs are, and it, and it's an education to get them to where they do that. But I think that it's important for us to know where the health care dollars are being spent on our health plan to, to help people. One of the things that we want to encourage is people when they're sick to go to the doctors. And one of the things I didn't talk to her about, and Daphne, if you could kind of ask her about this, is primary care physicians in this area are... Uh, scarce. Scarce, that's a good word. And there's a different cost for urgent care. And what we want to try to do with the healthcare people is try to get them to treat urgent care visits the same as primary care visits because urgent care people now are saying, well, you can use us for a primary care because we can do the same things as a primary care. So what we want to try to do is see if we can start to work to where primary care and urgent care visits are classified the same way. With Apple Care, Apple Care actually charges us a regular doctor visit, not urgent care, with the exception of Blue Cross. Okay, well, we need to kind of look at how we can do something like that and achieve that, which I think will lower our cost. If we, if we know that people are going to urgent care and they're billing us at either emergency care or some other lower rate than ur than um, urgent correct, emergency care, but higher than uh, primary care, then we need to look at that and see what we can do to change that. And um, I'm kind of off of this take it or leave it from the health care people. I will say that right now the urgent care deductible, uh, sorry, copay on the two plans with copays is $100 for urgent care versus $30 for a primary care and that uh, if the goal is indeed to help make people healthier and get them to go to the doctor when they have a problem $100 to go to an urgent care is quite a deterrent to many of our employees. Yes, we got to get a, a couple of uh, champions for the health saving plan um, because if someone got to say yeah I took it and it, it really saved me money and and whatever you know they got to you know you got to have those champions to do that to have others to follow suit. That's the only way I think we'll get more people in it. So. Okay. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe you and I can sit down with all the employees as this thing starts off and talk to them about. Maybe so. But That's testimonials, right. I think, is what you're saying yes. from yeah, exactly. from employees that maybe signed up last year that's having a good result. And right. And and they can have it even if they're on one of the the plans with a deductible. That's True. what they need to understand. True. They can't have an HSA account with one of those other. Right. And the one qualified HSA plan that we currently have is okay. So I'll have to go back and reread the, the the tax law again, but I think any individual can have a health savings account. No, that used to be. I oh, think they, they did change it, change that. Now you I have health savings account. I have one just like you talking about. Now you well, have to be on a high deductible a plan. Health savings, a high deductible health insurance plan that's that's specifically notated for an HSA. Okay. It can't be just because it, it is a high deductible. Health plan it has to be designated as an HSA. Plan. And if I'm not mistaken, high deductible starts at five thousand, right? Um, something I'm in that sure something in that range. Is, but it is, yeah, it's and higher. So percentage. for many of our employees, they may not have five thousand dollars currently in a savings account to get them started until they can build some of those pre-tax <laughs> funds up. How did we go from our deductible went up higher last year? Am I right? Yes, sir. What thirty-five hundred dollars? You say? Yeah. Before it was what we had. We had, the, we had five hundred and fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah. This year we have fifteen and thirty-five hundred dollar offerings. The problem with the, the five hundred was that yeah. they hit the five hundred. It hit it pretty hit, quickly. They hit it real quick. Yeah. And that drove all of our cost up. 
Right. So okay. when they came back and offered us up. So so basically, we're looking at saving money for ourselves, for the company, uh, and saying some of that cost was passed on to our employees. Oh, yeah, last year, all, all of it. Was. All of the cost last year was passed Generally, on to the employees. Generally, we have shared it in the, in the relationship of what we, what we pay, mm -hmm. and then we would pick up 80. But that is too expensive for us to do right. at the same time. So what you're sitting with is the fact that we continue to grow the employee cost for health care, which then results in behavior we don't want. And, and you know, if, if a person is near diabetic, we want him to be getting that maintenance stuff and not, right. you know, we also want to encourage things such as uh, losing weight, uh, smoking cessation, healthy, and healthy. those kinds of things to improve their health. Healthy choices, yes, sir. Um, do we know how many people have come close to, the deduct to, that, to their deductible, 1,500 or 3,500? We don't We're know that? We're not that information. We're not. But wouldn't we know if the, if the, if the uh, health care company can tell us that, can't they? They can't break it down by name. They don't have to no, break it by say name. They just break it by. I'll, I'll ask. That's all I can do. You know, do, that's, that's all. I don't care to know who the employees are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I care to know how it's being spent and who's doing that. I don't know how to break it down, but I'll certainly ask. I will say it, $3,500 deductible sounds like a high deductible, but you can hit that pretty quickly. Pretty quick nowadays, you can? You can. I mean, um, if you go for a, a simple procedure, if you're of age where you need to get a colonoscopy, you're going to spend almost that entire deductible paying for that visit. Jeez. And then the other thing I, I think we ought to consider and recommend is that if we have people go in the HSA, that we put $500 in their account. Last year, last year we did not do that. That would be something great. What about, so, what about healthy screening? Do, you know, do we um, give them points for going through a health screening? Currently, that does not happen, no, sir. There are other agencies that provide uh, a reduction in the the week the biweekly cost if you are not a tobacco user, what? or if you go through a health screening process. You know, ten or fifteen bucks every paycheck coming off your premium that makes a big difference for a lot of people. If right. the if you don't use tobacco and you do the screening, you may get thirty, forty dollars off your premium right. each two weeks. That can make a big difference. Right. And we do have a large percentage of our employees that are tobacco users. So if we offer the ability to get a reduction for those that don't use tobacco, it may incentivize some of them to stop using tobacco, sure. which would benefit our overall healthiness as an organization. Yes. Great. Okay. We ready to move on to the next topic? Okay, retirement plan changes. Yes, sir. Uh, we got the uh, Siegel Consulting, who is the actuary for our plan with the Georgia Municipal Association, to run some scenarios for us. We picked three scenarios. Um, these certainly are not the only three that are available for us. Okay. Can you start off with a brief description of our retirement program? Our existing program is a uh, defined benefit plan. The current employees do not pay anything into that plan. We have, we begin vesting in three years and are 100% vested in five years. So after three years, you're 33%, then 66, and then 100% after five years. Um, and what is the benefit that, that when they retire? Uh, it's, it's a calculation based off of uh, maximum years of 30%. It's a percentage of your overall salary multiplied by the number of years of service. So each year of service gets you, I think, an additional 2% of your uh, salary after the baseline. So if you work 30 years, you end up with a 90 to 100 percent of your existing salary as part of your retirement. 60 percent? Okay, sorry. I'm a little away from retirement. My apologies. Um, so you end up with quite a, quite a lot of your, your funds back there. Um, currently, the city has a defined contribution plan. Employees pay 3 sure. percent. That was a recent change mm -hmm. four or five years ago, maybe, maybe yep. not even that long. Yes. Um, and the county still has a defined benefit plan. Their employees do not pay into their retirement program. That is probably the process of yeah. being changed. That's my understanding as well. Um, 
So we looked at the scenarios with Siegel. We, we looked at three different scenarios. One, we did 2.5%, but we could certainly do 3% like the, the city is doing and potentially the county would be changing to. Uh, simply not changing the vesting schedule and just going with two and a half, with the contribution from the employees. And this is for future new hires. Say if we started this January 1, everyone hired after January 1 would be on a new plan. Um, we looked at the contribution plus a five-year cliff on the vesting instead of after three years, the partial vesting, and then a 10-year cliff. Um, and there's two charts on the back of here. The first chart doesn't really tell you a great deal of information. That's the per, uh, contribution rate as percentage of total payroll. Um, so as payroll increases, your contribution rate percentage-wise decreases, but your total amount may not necessarily decrease. So if you flip to the next page, the actual dollar figure is included as part of the contribution amount. The blue line on that is what if we stay with the existing plan moving forward. Uh, you can see that that continues to increase as we move forward as, as salaries increase, um, as well as the unfunded portion of our pension program is amortized on a 30-year schedule, just like your mortgage is. Uh, so we do have to pay on that each year to get that down. The, the idea would be after 30 years, your unfunded portion would, would not be zero, would be much closer to zero. Talking to the folks at Siegel, they consider a plan to be essentially fully funded if you're above 90%. There are limitations once you get to 100% funded of what you can continue to put in there without causing uh, tax problems for your employees. And then we looked at these three plans here. You can see that the total contribution amount decreases not initially because you'd have to get new employees in the plan, but it does decrease pretty drastically if, as we move forward with our turnover rate. We have a turnover rate here. It's quite high of about 15% each year, and it's been that way for the last five or six years. We have 150 employees, so 15% of that's around 20 to 25 employees a year that would be going off the program. Um, so as we got those new people in, we would get, they would be on the new plan, and uh, our average employee tenure is only about nine years, but that's somewhat inflated by a couple of very long-term employees. If you look at the media number, it's closer to five years of how long people have been employed with us. Now, hopefully that number is increasing as we are becoming a, a better and better organization to work for, but so far we do see continuous turnover. So as we do the plans, that turnover rate, those uh, rates decrease. Now, my understanding from the commission is one of the things that they're concerned about is the unfunded liability that has been accruing over time. We're almost at $2 million on an unfunded liability number. So I passed out this chart right before we came in here today. The, now, these numbers are approximate based off of trying to extrapolate from these charts here. This is based off the red line, which is the center line, just to give you some idea. The green portion is what the annual contribution by Joint Water and Sewer would be. The blue line that goes across that blue area is if we continued to fund the pension at the exact same amount as we did now. If we went with a new plan starting January 1, we currently pay, for, or pay around 650000 for our pension each year as joint water and sewer. As the amount that we're required to pay would decrease with the new po people coming on, if we continued to fund it at that $650,000 level, you would be making a substantial dent in the unfunded portion each year. If you're adding an extra fifty dollars or $100,000 to that because the, the required funding is decreasing, you're catching up on that amortization, basically like making additional payments on your mortgage to get it paid off quicker. Our existing plan is supposed to be paid off based off the overall amortization in about 15 years, according to the actuarial tables. Uh, we could probably cut that in half by doing this plan here. So we'd basically be not fully funded again. You, it's unlikely you're ever going to get to 100% funded. On this funded. plan, what plan are you talking about? Doing what? This would be the, sorry, this would be the, the based off the red line, which is 2.5% and five-year vesting. We could do any of the other ones. 2.5% for, for employees, employees contribution. Yes, sir. Okay. And then eventually, the overall, your required, your required payments each year, if you have no unfunded portion of your pension, is 6%. That's what the actuaries are going to charge us. So if the employees are paying 2.5, then the... We'd be three and a half as the joint water and sewer. If it was three, it'd be half and half. All right. Currently, we're paying about eight and a half percent because we're paying two and a half percent additional to pay off that unfunded portion. Right. 
So as the amount we're required to pay because the new employees would be contributing to the plan decreases, the percentage going towards the unfunded portion would increase. You are um, advocating that only new employees are going to be paying the 2.5% and not, not the current employees? That's correct. The Talking to Siegel, their uh, attorneys have stated that uh, in the past, if you were on a defined benefit plan and went to a defined contribution plan, it is more appropriate in their attorney's eyes to maintain that because if you go to a defined contribution plan, then they have lowered their benefit. Essentially, you're taking an employee that's on one benefit and taking him to what is considered a lower benefit. If they're on new plans, if everyone's on the contribution plan, for example, and you decide to go from 25 to 3%, you're not necessarily majorly impacting that. That is what the conversation with Siegel happened yesterday. Right. I understand that, the fact that they may be lowering their benefit, but, however, we have given them a benefit by allowing them not to pay uh, into this, this plan. I, I think, you know, the company has been more, than, more than, than generous to do that. We did, it, we did the same thing with Jekyll Island and found out that we really couldn't do it anymore. Right. The state, as a matter of fact, the state was doing it. They realized they couldn't do it anymore. Right. I understand. So, in a sense, it's just like... Okay, all of a sudden we was giving them a lollipop. Okay, now we can't afford to give you a lollipop anymore, so what? Right. The, uh, I will say that the city, my understanding, did grandfather in existing staff members. For a certain period of time. Um, for some of their employees before they, they didn't just take everyone and put them on the new plan. Right. Um, and one of the things I suggested from a, a legal perspective is if you decided to put everyone on the new plan, the way they would consider it not being a reduced benefit would be if you required a 3% contribution, then you gave the existing employees a 3% salary increase to cover that, which would end up costing you a considerable amount more money. But why are we trying to give them more anyhow? We, we, we've already given them, the defined benefit plan was, was basically something that was really, really good. Absolutely. Okay. And so if your company can no longer maintain that, then this is understood the fact that there we are. If they, if they choose to stay with the company, then this is the guidelines that they will have to. And I think, Mayor, that's that's exactly. I, th I think you just hit the nail on the head. If they stay with the company, and I think if we if we change the benefit, there'll be a certain number of employees that would start looking somewhere else. What value do those people have? But to I don't. Us I don't think they the would training. ever get another plan exactly like this uh, one. It, though it might not be the plan. It might be other. It might be other well, attributes. And and. Bottom line is, once somebody gets used to having a free lunch and you take that free lunch away, uh, they're not thinking, well, I, I really enjoyed a free lunch all this time. Uh, they're, they're saying, hey, man. They're, taking they're, some from me. You you're taking, taking some, some from me. Essentially, if say we went with a 3% plan, the way it's going to land on the employees is, well, I just got a 3% pay cut. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we had to deal with that in the city, too. We had to deal yeah. with that. But, but the reality of the fact is that uh, either that or the, the plan's gonna gonna cost so much until the company won't be able to absorb it. Well, but that's what this is seeking to do, is is hit the middle ground and well, with well, our attrition Well, you rate. look at it like this, you know. Okay, so so they keep paying, paying. Uh, we keep paying for the defined benefit plan. Keep paying, the company keep paying. Pretty soon we can't pay anymore. That means that now raises we can't give raises to people. So therefore, therefore they're limiting their, their ability to to obtain raises as well. So. It's really, you have to make a decision one way or the other. And, and, and I think the fact that, as I said, we're giving them a free lunch, we was giving them something of the benefit, but now we can't no longer afford to do that. Either that or the company, the company decide, well, we can't do it anymore. Now what we do, we decide, well, we close up shop. What, everybody loses? Well, I'm not sure that we're in that. I'm not going to close up shop, but I'm just saying, you know, the, the concept of the thing is the same. The same. We can't no, long, no longer afford to do it. Something not to give somewhere. Well, I think the turmoil that will be caused in the workforce would be great if we didn't just make the next new employee the new deal. And, and again, if you're looking at a 15% turnover rate each year, you're never going to get, well, well, I mean, eventually you'll get all new employees, but it won't be immediate. But within a five-year window, you're going to have well over half of your employees that are on the new plan versus the existing plan. Um, and we've got several employees now that are retirement eligible. So even if they didn't decide to necessarily from a turnover, from a quitting perspective, they will be 
retiring very soon on that. So we would have a tremendous amount of turnover on the, into the new plan in a short period of time. And I mean, this, my suggestion here would be to flatline the funding. We don't have to do that. We could take the decreased required cost and just keep amortizing that unfunded portion out like they're suggesting right now. You know, we are a very good company and we are very good to our employees. I mean, it's one of the, the better, uh, most young employees don't, don't really see that, that benefit like that. Um, but the, I guess the older ones who've been there for a while, they're looking for that. Right. If you phase that in a certain period of time, then maybe they may be looking at retirement. They're on the, on the far end of retirement anyhow, so it, it'll just be through attrition as well. But uh, to just have just the, just the new employees to fund this thing, is, is I don't think that's right. But the new well, employees are, are basically they're on a new plan. I don't, they're, they're, yeah, I don't know that. I see yeah. that. You know, we had to change ours. We're not picking up the deficit. You know, it's a tough other. decision, but we had to change it because pretty soon we can't afford it. And, and really, the, the JWC won't be won't be able to afford to give these raises either. So pretty soon, if we keep doing doing like this, we won't be able to afford to give the raises. So if you look at it from that standpoint, and if you talk to employees uh, by going on the going on the, the uh, new plan uh, contribution plan, then they can see. Basically, they may be able to get raises. Just my thoughts. Certainly, like you said, if, if we continue with the existing plan and change nothing, it's going to get to the point where we can't afford it. Yeah. That that 100% is correct. Um, so are you looking for the middle ground is to have the new employees? To yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> the new employees. They're, they're hired with a new understanding. They're. You know. The new employees basically comes in, most of them are entry level. Most of you have more entry level employees than you have. Sure. Uh, so they're not going to affect this very often, very, it's not going to be very impactful in the first couple of years. At all. Uh, sure, absolutely. In the first couple of years, you're not going to see a major decrease. It'll be years four and five when you start seeing that decrease. But from a, a long range perspective, it does end up paying off. It's not going to make it a long range. What, 15 years, you said? The existing plan would be paid off in 15 years. You'll start seeing a decrease here in the year three or four, and the extra contribution should have it, the unfunded portion down inside of 10 years. 10 years. Yes, sir. Okay. But essentially, the plan works out to where the employee is putting 3.5% in, and the company's put 3.5% in. Yes, that's, that's the contribution. Mm -hmm. Right. So we but right now it's not, and, and basically, um, well, eighty-five percent of our employees uh, have this uh, uh, defined benefit plan, and they will have this defined benefit plan until they retire or or, or leave the organization. That's correct. That after after the first year, after the second year, you'd be closer to seventy percent that were still on it, and so on and so if forth. If we have attrition, yes, sir. Which unfortunately we have you, had consistent well, attrition. Well, well, you know, our, our main goal is to stop attrition. Yeah, absolutely, so, I agree so, with that. Um, but we do have we have had consistent attrition for the past five or six years. One year we had over thirty new hires. So and we have to make some decision. Yes, sir. Well, we'll be discussing it again. Yes, sir. Now, speaking with Siegel, um, if we decided to go with a, a new entrant type plan, if we voted on this the second meeting in December, you could have new entrants after January 1 on the new plan. So it's not a, you don't have to, it's not a long-term process to get that changed. Is it possible to uh, have them to go back and look at? Um, well, I imagine we paid money for this this we thing. Then, so uh, this study cost us so about four grand thus far. So I mean, not huge money, but it is costing. Well, I think we probably can look at this thing too to see if we do it uh, phasing in um, um, our current force uh, within five years or something like that. You know, see what that would cost us. It, it may be a good saving. It may not be. If it's not that much of a saving, then, you know, I'm just... Okay. We can certainly take a look at it. Yes, so There might not be anything to do. 
and then I can look at, I think, item number two with the phase in of five years of. We can certainly take a look at that, yes, sir. Okay, last item on the agenda is the uh, salary survey. Yes, yes sir. Uh, after the request of the committee last time, um, went back and looked at more regional statistics instead of national statistics on the uh, salary survey, so I did it three ways. One, I sent out uh, a request for salaries to approximately 20 utilities in our area, either because of in Southeast Georgia or North Florida, excluding Jacksonville, because that's certainly gonna skew some of the statistics there, as well as other utilities in the state of Georgia that are similar size to us, not around the city of Atlanta, because certainly that's gonna increase salaries based off the cost of living. Um, so I, got, I was fortunate to get eight utilities that responded back to me. Uh, we've got a, a good mix of utilities in that area. We've got utilities, uh, the Jekyll Island responded, Kingsland responded, you also got uh, Columbus, Georgia, Albany, Georgia responded. So you got a good mix of utilities that responded to this. What I did on this table here um, is the minimum and maximum. That is the, this is based off the midpoint salaries that that were provided. Um, the minimum midpoint on the, the first column, the maximum, and then what, where the midpoint for the joint water and sewer is on the right-hand side there. Um, overall, there are a couple of positions where we are the highest on the midpoint. There are a couple of positions where we're, um, much lower than the highest uh, on there. Uh, so it's kind of a, a mixed bag in that regard. Uh, you'll see a dashed line under the director of administration. Uh, we had multiple of the ones that submitted call me and asked me what that position entailed. And they have, they have, most of them have separated their business office manager position and their PIO position and pay for two people to fulfill those duties. We have that as one. So there's the data for both of those in there compared to what joint water and sewer pays for one employee there. Um, wide range in some of the positions, um, the superintendent positions appear to be um, adequate and as well as the um, engineering and finance positions are well within range there. So I also looked at it on the Bureau of Labor Statistics provides data based off of metropolitan areas and that metropolitan is a little bit of a misnomer. There are, it based, based off of city districts, so Brunswick is technically a metropolitan area according to the Bureau of Labor, uh, and so on and so forth. So I pulled all of the, uh, the ones in our area and compared it, and they also have some that are non-metropolitan, so there's a South Georgia non-metropolitan that includes all the small communities that aren't around large cities uh, in there, and pulled that information for the, uh, the groups for all industries, and there's the information there. Now certainly some of this data is gonna be skewed because some of the industries are going to be higher paying um, but we were well within range on these. And then on the, we also pulled it based off the state of Georgia industry data, based off of the utility industry. They have three different classifications based off the NAICS code. Utilities, water and sewer, and water and sewer construction are all separate uh, statistics there. And also pulled local government as well. And if you look across the board there on that information, um, we are also within range. There's a couple of positions, again, where we're nearer to the top of the list on some of these, but overall, it appears that most of our positions are within accepted ranges across the state. Now, unfortunately, I didn't get all 20 of those surveys back, so there may be some people that would have skewed the data either up or down compared to what they sent back, but I was fortunate to get the ones back that I got. Now, certainly, if we included the city of Jacksonville or the city of Atlanta, those would have inflated the statistics drastically, but these do not include those two cities or any of the surrounding communities that are the suburbs of those cities. It's good information. Yeah, I hold my comments later uh, uh, for executive session if we need one. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Anything else? Okay, with that, the Human Resources Committee is adjourned. Thanks, sir. All right. Thank you.